Hello, again. Uh, my name is uh, Shai Bannon. Uh, you also know me as Kimchi on Twitter and other sites. Uh, I'm going to talk about Elasticsearch. It's a project that I started. Um, specifically, uh, we're going to focus about how to uh, design uh, and use Elasticsearch for storing large amounts of data. Uh, and the last part is it's going to be a bit uh, uh, quicker is how to use Elasticsearch for more than just full-text search or effectively analytics. <clears throat> this talk is uh, going to focus mainly on those two areas. I assume that you've probably seen or know a bit about how Elasticsearch, what it does, um, and how to use it in terms of APIs, um, and, um, and you know, the fact that it's built on Lucene and things like that. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, the first part that we are going to cover is uh, effectively data design patterns, uh, which is very important. When you build a, an application, it's very important to understand how data flows into the application or your storage. Uh, this allows you to uh, make very uh, calculated decisions on how you want to structure Elasticsearch, your indexes, and your uh, distributed capabilities when you work with it. Um, but let's start with uh, the basic. Uh, let's say we have a single node. A node is effectively you know, a JVM or something like that. Uh, and we want to create a simple index. Uh, here's an example with a curl request uh, where we create a test index uh, and it has a single shard. That already takes you really, really long, uh, really, really far when it comes to Elasticsearch uh, and Lucene under the covers. Uh, uh, it allows you to store quite a bit of data on, on, the, on that specific shard, executed searches, um, any, any index operation that you execute are completely persistent uh, uh, right after the return. Um, and uh, and you, a lot of users just you know, start with Elasticsearch with a simple configuration like that. But then things get more interesting, uh, your application becomes successful, or you need more nodes to try to accommodate other things like high availability, so you add another node. But then you're, you have a problem, basically. And the problem is that there's really no scaling factor that you have. You have a single shard. And the only option that we have is to potentially split it into two, because we want some of the data to exist on the other node as well. But that can be expensive. Uh, and splitting a shard to two effectively means re-indexing the data or parts of the data uh, that are relevant to move them to the other node. Um, you cannot do it now with Elasticsearch, though possibly in the future you will be able to split shards. Uh, so we need to try and somehow solve this problem, and um, let's, let's give it another go. Uh, we still have one node, but instead of having one shard, we can actually start with two shards. Um, and that's, again, very easy when you, when you create the index. Uh, you just specify that you want to have two shards instead of one. But what effectively it means is that when we actually uh, start another node, Elasticsearch can automatically move that shard for you to the second node. And what we're actually doing is that we're over-allocating shards. So the number of shards are effectively your uh, scaling unit. Uh, it's a very common architecture. Uh, other, other systems call it virtual nodes uh, or things to that nature. And the benefit that we get with that is the fact that when we move shards, we don't have to re-index the data. We simply move bytes around. Uh, and, and, and that means that the overhead on a cluster uh, that is now handling relocation of shards by adding or, or removing nodes uh, is considerably uh, less than having to re-index or split data. Um, one of the, a lot of the, if you, if you saw, you know, if you saw, follow the NoSQL space, you'll see that a lot of the cases where systems break happens when um, there's a specific load on the system, and we have, I don't know, five or ten nodes or something like that, and that load keeps on increasing, and you get into the 80, 90 percent capacity of your cluster. Um, and then you're, you're say, okay, no problem. Our system is scalable. We'll just add one more node, or we'll add five more nodes to the system. The problem is that you're already in an 80% capacity of your system. So just by adding more nodes, the fact that data needs to be resharded uh, brings that uh, capacity level to 120% or 130% just by that effort, which brings your whole cluster down. 
And there's tons of stories about uh, uh, things like that happening with different solutions. Uh, so uh, with Elasticsearch, at least, the goal is to not re-index or split data, uh, but instead move data around. And uh, we'll see, obviously, uh, how we can uh, create some different design patches that we can do in order to, uh, to accommodate different data flows that we want to handle. The next bit in Elasticsearch are obviously replicas. Uh, replicas allow you to have multiple copies of data for high availability. So if one node fails, I still have another copy of the, of the data, and the system adapts to the fact that a specific node fails. In Elasticsearch itself, they also serve, uh, they also, uh, serve read, and they allow you actually to scale search. So what Elasticsearch does is it does uh, uh, synchronous replication. Uh, so or active replication. So whenever you index a document, it will go and be indexed on the rep relevant replicas, which means that when we search, we can search on the replicas as well and still see a, a, a near real-time view of our data. Um, and that's compared to other replication models where you tail uh, a change log or something like that where you can get really far behind in terms of uh, what happens on your replica. Adding replicas in Elasticsearch is quite simple. You can set them, obviously, when you create the index, but uh, you can also change them on the fly. So this is, this is something that we can change on the fly on an existing index. So in our case, we just uh, update the settings of an index and just uh, change the number of replicas to one. Um, and then automatically, those replicas will be allocated, and, and, uh, uh, allocated on the two nodes appropriately. And now we actually have uh, one copy of the data. And then if we add another node, the system can automatically move shards around in order to accommodate the fact that we have an additional nodes. Um, and obviously, we can also go and increase the replicas even more to two replicas, uh, which effectively we have now three copies of the data, uh, to even have better high availability. One, things that a lot of, uh, one thing that a lot of Elasticsearch users uh, miss at the beginning, at least, is that this doesn't really help us a lot when it comes to search, because a single shard in this case, in the previous case, is already quite capable in handle, handling a, a lot of concurrent search requests uh, and, and obviously indexing requests as well. So if we, if we just increase here the number of replicas to two, we, we got better high availability, but we won't necessarily see better search performance, because we already had uh, a nice distribution of single shards on, 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 on each node. Uh, and if we want to make use of more replicas to increase search performance, we should add more nodes so they can uh, even out between all of them. So uh, another nice feature, and what we're doing now is we're building the, uh, the vocabulary of what Elasticsearch provides you on all the different features, and then we'll slowly see uh, interesting design flows and design patterns that we want to use. So another feature that Elasticsearch has is multiple uh, indices. Effectively, what we can say is that we, uh, a single cluster, in this case a three-node cluster, can have different indices with different uh, uh, sharding cap uh, characteristics uh, around them. For example, test one here has two shards, test two has three shards, and test three has one shard. And they'll even out uh, across the cluster um, to make use of all the different nodes in the cluster themselves. And what Elasticsearch does is that it allows you to easily search across indices. Uh, here's a simple um, URL, a URI endpoint that I, I'm effectively searching on test one, test two, and test three indices. Uh, note that they have different shard, uh, shard counts. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Uh, in Elasticsearch itself, searching on one index with 50 shards or searching on 50 uh, indices with one shard, it's exactly the same. Uh, there isn't really a difference between the two. Let's talk about, uh, a bit about uh, sizing. Um, there isn't really a maximum shard size. E each shard is a leucine index. And there isn't really a maximum shard size, but uh, there is actually a maximum shard size, but it's, uh, sadly, it's not something that is easy to compute. I can't, you know, I've seen shards with, with uh, half a million documents, and I've seen shards with, uh, with 100,000 documents. Uh, there's 
Uh, it really depends on the type of hardware the nodes are running on, how, many, uh, how much memory you allocate to the, to the JVM itself, the number of nodes, the, si uh, the docs, the size of each docs, and what type of searches you execute. Um, the thing that I'm, I usually recommend when using Elasticsearch is that it, this, this part is very, very easy to do capacity tests based on that. Just create a single, uh, just uh, fire up a single node, create a, uh, a single shard, and load the data that you are going to use and execute the searches that uh, are going to be used uh, uh, in your application. And then it's quite easy to see what, what is the capacity that a single shard uh, is going to be able to hold and then derive from that uh, the, the sharding practices that you're going to do in your, in your actual uh, Elasticsearch cluster. And because there is uh, some sort of a, a maximum size for, for a shard, you effectively have a maximum size for an index, which is effectively the number of shards that we have times the, the, the shard size. And, uh, and it's an important, uh, important aspect to understand that replicas really don't, don't play any part here. They are only additional copies of the data. Uh, but they do need to be taken into account where you're doing cluster-wide sizing. Obviously, if you have one copy of the data, you need twice the number of nodes, potentially, compared to having no copies of the data. <clears throat> so, up until now, uh, we talked a bit about, uh, about different aspects of Elasticsearch in terms of sizing and indexes and shards. And the first thing that uh, you might say is, okay, Ha, there's problems with capacity. Let's create a, an index with a kajillion shards or something like that. And, you know, then we won't have any problems. Well, effectively, you do have problem with a kajillion shards. Uh, each shard comes at a cost. Uh, it's a leucine index under the covers, so it comes with uh, resources usage like memory requirements, file descriptors, things to that nature. Obviously, also uh, uh, a single index or, a single, uh, or less segments in an index, they can make more use of uh, the size of the data that is actually being used on disk and, and, and the amount of memory that they require because they co can compact data more uh, properly. And obviously, the other problem that you have when you have a, uh, a lot of shards is that having a lot of shards or a lot of virtual nodes in other uh, distributed systems, it might be okay when you do key value lookups. So if you only do index and gets in Elasticsearch, that's not a problem. Uh, or if you do very, very small range-based lookups, if you design your keys correctly in other systems. But when you do a distributed search, the search will have to go and, and, and you don't do any uh, uh, range base uh, or some sort of uh, uh, limiting the number of shards it's going to hit. It's going to have to hit all the shards. And that's going to be expensive if you only have three nodes and I've created 1,000 shards, obviously. Uh, so it is a factor also of the number of nodes. If you have a 50-node cluster, sure, you can create uh, 300 shards. But if you have two-node cluster, 300 shards for a single index, it's probably overkilling it. <clears throat> so let's talk about, a bit about sample data flows. Th those are extreme cases, or in, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the more interesting data flows. Remember that by default, Elasticsearch creates five shards for an index, uh, and that can take you a really, really long way down the road, especially considering, uh, depending on the number of nodes that you have in the cluster. Um, so let's, let's talk about the different data flows that we have in the system. One of them, which I like to call the uh, users type data flow. So we, we build an application. Uh, and each user has its own set of documents. And it doesn't matter. It's like, I don't know, think about Gmail, and each user has its own mails that I want, each user wants to search across, or things of that nature. Uh, in that typical data flow, there's uh, usually a big variance. You have, most users don't have a lot of documents, and obviously a lot of documents depends on the type of application that you're building. But some users have a considerably more documents compared to most of the other users. And also, most of the searches themselves are actually executed per user. Uh, so uh, just a user wants to find his own data, uh, not across all, all data itself. So let's try and solve something like that with Elasticsearch. The first thing that you uh, might consider, which is a very valid point, is let's create an index per user. Elasticsearch allows us to very easily create index, uh, indexes uh, dynamically. So we can create an index per user. 
uh, and possibly each, each, uh, each user index has different sharding, capabilities, uh, sharding uh, characteristics. And the search is very simple. We'll just go to the specific user and execute a search. Uh, it only searches on that specific uh, user data. Obviously, for administration capabilities or things like that, you can always search across more than one users or all users. What is the problem with that? A single shard, and we talked about it before, can hold a substantial amount of data, usually, uh, in terms of docs and size. And what it effectively means is that small users, that, for example, has only, have only 1,000 documents or something like that, they become uh, very resource uh, expensive. So the cost of maintaining a single shard for that small user doesn't make sense uh, for our application. Uh, effectively, that single shard could have held quite easily uh, a thousand users, but we're only using it for a single user. Uh, this can be solved by having simply, simply having more nodes to support so many users. That's not a problem, but for uh, you know, uh, companies that are you know, startups and things like that, you don't, wanna, you don't want to, a lot of times you don't want to have so many nodes in the cluster because they simply cost more money. Um, so another way to try and solve it um, is to have a single index. Uh, all users are effectively stored on the same index, and we're over-allocating the, the usual trick, over-allocating of shards to support future growth. <clears throat> so what does it mean? Uh, when we execute a search, we filter by user ID. Uh, and if you know Lucene a bit, then filter caching makes this re really, really, really fast uh, compared to other solutions. And when we search, we search and goes, search uh, go uh, to all the shards. And that brings us back to the Kajillion shards problem, right? Because it's expensive to do very large over allocations of shards. Uh, and this is a very simple example of how a search will be executed. Uh, we'll put the query uh, in the query part within the filtered one, and we always filter by a specific user. <clears throat> OK, so uh, we try to have a, an index per user, which might be a valid solution. We, we uh, talked about a single index. Another nice feature that Elasticsearch has is actually the ability to, to, uh, to control uh, where subsets of the data are going to exist. It's called routing. And when we index a document, we can actually say, uh, don't use the ID, which is used by default to uh, route a specific uh, document to a shard but use a uh, routing value that we are going to provide you externally. <clears throat> so when we index it, uh, uh, what we can um, use is that uh, all the data for a specific user, we can force it to be on the same shard by sp simply using routing as the user ID. And then when you search, you use also the same routing value if it's a, a search for a, spe for a specific user's data. Uh, and then we use filtering. And we always hit a single shard because we use that routing value. This means that we can do very large over allocation of shards, like three nodes can easily have a 50, 100, or 300 shards. Um, but every user will end up in, the, in, the, in their own respective shard, and we have future, a considerable amount of future growth. Like If we have 50 or 100 shards, we can effectively grow from two nodes to 100 without losing any capability in terms of uh, growing the data sizes. And I'm putting replicas on the side now. I'm not referring to them. And this is a very common design pattern for users that use Elasticsearch. And actually, Elasticsearch takes, a, takes it a, a step further and tries to even simplify that more by the ability to associate aliases with indexes. So what we can do is that we can have an alias for each user and that alias name will be the user underscore one or the user underscore user ID effectively uh, that points to the user's index, has a filter associated with it, which effectively filters all the data that is relevant only for that user, and has a routing associated with it, which is the uh, user ID. And then what we can do is that instead of working against the user's index, we work directly against each user's own view of the, effectively a view of the index. So we can index uh, uh, documents against the user one, underscore one alias, and it will automatically apply the relevant routing. We can uh, search against user underscore one, and it will automatically both apply the routing and do the, the relevant filtering, so we don't have to care about that. 
Um, and it also, the, another nice feature is that it automatically supports multi-aliases searching. So we can put user underscore one and user underscore two, and it, it will automatically do an OR, for example, between the different filters to find all the relevant data, and obviously hit only the relevant shards that are appropriate to that list of aliases. <coughs> And uh, what we can also do is that even if we have 50, 100, or 150 shards, effectively we might have uh, a customer that is considerably larger than all the other, or a user that is considerably larger than the other users that we have. And for that user, we can simply uh, migrate that user into its own index without the application filling it to a degree. They'll still work with the same alias. We'll simply take the, that user data, move it to his own index, specific index, and then change the alias to point to that new index. Um, and this allows us to, uh, to handle cases where, I don't know, you're a small startup, but suddenly uh, Twitter becomes a customer. Uh, so, uh, so they might need considerably more data than your typical uh, freemium-based users or something like that. Any questions on that area up until now, by the way? OK. Uh, so let's talk about uh, time-based uh, data flow. Uh, so we talked about users. Another common scenario that we have in terms of how data flows in the system is time-based. Uh, you can think about it as logs or social streams, like to, uh, we're indexing Facebook data or Twitter data or any basically time-based events. Uh, download counts, uh, clicks, things like that. Uh, dogs are usually have a timestamp associated with it, and they don't really change that much. Uh, so effectively, once a specific uh, time range has passed, nothing is going to change in that time range anymore. Um, let's try and design a system uh, to handle that. Uh, for a time-based data flow, we can start with a single index, obviously, and data keeps flowing into that single index with, uh, with uh, our own sharding that we decided with a number of shards, and the problem is that because data keeps flowing into the index, eventually it's going to explode and not be able to handle all that data. So a nicer solution for that is to have an index per time, time range. So we can create an index per week, per day, per month, uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, and index that data into, uh, into uh, the, its own respective index based on the timestamp. Um, this allows us also to easily adapt to future changes. If suddenly we decide to index more of Twitter or more of Facebook, uh, the, the new index that we're going to create for, that for the next week might have more shards compared to the other indexes that we created before. Um, so it really uh, gives you a... a an unbounded ability to grow in terms of the cluster and in terms of the indexes. And obviously, you can search across all the indexes if you want to execute a search, but a lot of times, a lot of people use, uh, just are interested in the more recent data, so you can always search on, on the last month or something like that. Uh, and you can search across uh, more than one index. And aliases uh, also simplify that because you have the ability so to associate an alias with multiple indexes. So for example, I can say, uh, I'll have an alias called the last two months. And in terms of the application itself, the people who, uh, the users who interact with the, with the search engine, they'll only use last two months or something like that. And you can, as, as uh, time passes, you can add, for example, an alias uh, for the, the current month and, and remove an alias from the previous month, uh, from, uh, I don't know, three months ago or something like that. Uh, so uh, it will automatically, when I search on the last two months, it will automatic, automatically expand to, uh, to search across the two indexes uh, relevant to that specific month. This also allows us to, uh, to uh, optimize, really optimize old indexes. So usually old indexes or indexes that the time has passed and they're no longer uh, being indexed with data, we can actually uh, optimize them. Uh, this is a more of a Lucene concept, but effectively it makes them use less storage and uh, be a bit faster when you, when you execute a search. And you can actually do really cool tricks like uh, really old indes ind indices that you uh, are search not as much as the, the current one, the hot indexes basically. You can actually move them to cheaper boxes. So if you're starting five nodes, for example, with a tag that says, and, and that tag can be any, any text that you want, 
uh, I chose tag. Uh, that uh, five nodes with a strong box and, uh, and uh, 20 nodes with a tag that says it's not so strong or it's, it's a cheaper box. Uh, once time has passed and it's up to you to decide when, we can actually force uh, all the shards to move to the cheaper boxes uh, and keep the current one and the hot one and the more strong boxes that we want to maintain. And that will happen automatically. Once you send that, Elasticsearch will automatically start to migrate shards to the, uh, to the, uh, to the not-so-strong boxes. <clears throat> and then really, really old indexes that we're no longer, we no longer care about, we can actually remove them. We can actually delete an index. Uh, and, and remember that deleting an index is a considerably cheaper operation compared to deleting docs. So you can say, uh, OK, I'll, I'll have, for example, a single index, but I'll keep on deleting all documents. Uh, but the problem is that with the way that uh, the system works, or Resim works, is that actually when you delete a document, it doesn't get actually deleted. So there's a merging process and a whole uh, process that tries to maintain the index itself, and eventually they get merged out. Uh, and that merge process can be expensive. So if we delete all data, if we delete an index, we simply remove files from the file system. So that's com considerably more lightweight compared to deleting documents. We can even close an index. And, and a closed index in, uh, in Elasticsearch, effectively what it means is that it's still in the, the, the metadata of the cluster. It's still there in the cluster. Uh, it still holds disk size. Uh, it, it still you know, occupies disk in terms of, of the index itself. But other than that, it doesn't hold any resources. So it doesn't have any uh, resources associated with being able to index to it or search against it. So it's a nice way of archiving data and only paying the price of just more disk usage. That makes sense up until now. <laughs> OK, cool. So this, uh, this ends the part a bit about the design flow of, uh, uh, or the design, data design patterns that you can uh, play with Elasticsearch. Uh, the main thing that you, uh, that, um, that you should take with you is the fact that because Elasticsearch, um, the aim of Elasticsearch is being very dynamic in terms of being API driven, it allows you to, uh, to really play with the, number, with the indexes, the number of indexes, the number of shards, uh, increasing, reducing replicas and things like that to build a, a really uh, capable system in terms of handling large, large amounts of data. Uh, the next bit that I wanted to talk about a bit, and that's something that people don't think about initially when, when, they're, uh, when they're looking at Elasticsearch, is that Elasticsearch can actually be used to more than that, just full text search. And I've, I've, I've worked with several users, uh, and, uh, and they're, funnily enough, don't use, don't use Elasticsearch for full text search. They use it only for, and I'll give you an example of what they do. So for example, um, a, a, a user, a very large user of Elasticsearch, they index time-based events. So they index things like, uh, I don't know, clicks or things like that, and they index it into the data. Uh, it's usually that uh, data has some sort of a timestamp, maybe a component, uh, some categories associated with it, uh, maybe even a browser or a country, and you can think of many different attributes that we can associate with a document. And obviously, this is perfect for time-based indexes that we talked about before in terms of data flow. Um, the nice bit about this part is that it allows us to slice and dice our data very, very easily. Um, you don't need to decide in advance how, you want, how are you going to slice and dice the data in order to get it back. Uh, a lot of systems, uh, or many systems, uh, force you to think in advance in how, for example, you construct your key. Uh, and what you put uh, within the key itself so they can make effective uh, range scans or things of to that nature. With this type of system, you don't really need to think about it that much. You just uh, index data into it, and it allows you to slice and dice your data. Um, and a lot of times for this type of data, which is, by the way, as you can see, it doesn't really have any full text search associated with it, even though it can if it's logs, for example. Uh, we can actually drive some uh, facets around it. So facets are effectively aggregations on top of uh, uh, of what was uh, of of all the hits that match a specific query. So in this case, we're we're using a date histogram 
to uh, count all the uh, hits that we have that match the query. In our case, we're just running it against everything. Uh, and we get counts per day. So each day, we get a count of how many uh, documents hit that uh, specific query. Uh, Here's, a, here's another uh, example where I, I, want, I, I try to show that you can have more than one facet, obviously. So those are two date histogram. Uh, the first one uh, counts, uh, returns you a graph for all the red uh, categories, and the other one returns you, uh, returns you all the counts for the uh, black uh, category. Um, another popular example is uh, using the terms facet in Elasticsearch, so I can uh, get counts per value per term, basically, per country in our case. Uh, and you, know, you can create things like uh, heat maps on, on, a, on a, a global map of showing, for example, where the downloads are coming from or things like that. And uh, we talked about the ability to slice and dice your data. Obviously, facets, it doesn't matter which facet you have, the ability to the, the rich query language that Elasticsearch exposes, a lot of those are actually you know, your typical Lucene queries, if you know Lucene. Uh, allows us to, uh, uh, allows us to uh, only execute the searches and get the aggregation on the specific uh, ways that we want to look at the data. And you can see just for, with four attributes how many options we have to slice and dice the data. And this gives you uh, the capability. For example, in this example, we only want to search uh, on, on, on documents with the category of red and black. Um, we can even have uh, more complex examples. Uh, we want to search on all the categories of red and black, but within a specific time range. Uh, and you can see how it allows us to uh, slice and dice your, da your data uh, even more as you build more complex queries if you want to try and understand something and how it, how it works. There's a lot more to it. Uh, there's uh, a, lot of, a lot more facet options in Elasticsearch. There's something called term st stats. You can actually run scripts uh, when you execute facets to maybe have uh, more complex uh, calculations. Uh, you can do uh, multidimensional uh, aggregations, like uh, uh, take uh, a break everything by day, but uh, aggregate another value from that document, for example, and give me the statistical information of that value. Filters, by the way, uh, play a major part here. I showed queries example, but filters are, are very strong uh, with the way that they're executed in Lucene and the way that they are exposed in Elasticsearch since they can be cached, which means that uh, it has a great story for, for all data. Uh, it doesn't, most of the filters don't have to be recalculated because they're uh, easily cached, and then when you execute a search, it's all running in memory effectively. Uh, and as you can see in our example, we didn't really use full-text search. Uh, and and I've, I've seen several uh, users now of Elasticsearch that actually has no full-text search uh, usage of Elasticsearch. They simply use it for aggregation and slicing and dicing the data. Um, and they love the ability, the fact that uh, regardless of what type of documents they're using uh, and what type of attributes they decide to associate with that document, they can easily uh, expose very rich analytics applications to their users. That's it. Um, any questions? Hey, uh, great talk. So, uh, what you. happens if my laptop almost fell? So, what what happens if an index keeps growing, right? And we don't expect it to. And it's like, can we add more shards to it while while it's growing? So, um, if if you create a, a specific uh, single index, then uh, you specify the number of shards it has, and you cannot change that value. And it was a very conscious decision when I made that decision early on in the life of Elasticsearch. And I said that in the future, there might be an option to, uh, to split indexes. The problem is that um, a lot of times, if you think about how your data flows, you can actually build a design. And I've, seen, uh, I've shown two of those, like the users and the time-based ones, where you can build a design that doesn't require you to split data. And splitting data is very expensive. Uh, uh, effectively, you have to re-index a huge part of it. So 
In the future, we might allow it, but I usually would recommend against it, uh, simply because of the fact that uh, it, it's very easy to get to a state where you have, and I talked about it, you have like I don't know, four or five nodes, you get to that 80, 90% capacity, and moving shards around, I mean, I've seen users with, uh, you know, they over allocated shards. The system was at 95% capacity in terms of heap usage, in terms of, you know, CPU and things like that. And they simply fire up more nodes and it, was, it just migrated cleanly without, you know, bringing the, the usage to a place where the, your whole cluster crashes. If we had to re index the data, then, then, then it's easy to get to a situation where your whole cluster, cluster uh, falls over. So that, that's the main reason why at least it's, uh, obviously it's technically capable, uh, to, uh, it's technically possible to split index uh, shards, uh, but I, I, I would usually not design a system that, that, that allows for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we <coughs> sorry. will it be possible to uh, make uh, uh, bulk updates in the next release? To make what? Sorry, bulk updates. Uh, bulk uh, updates uh, in documents. In in zero nineteen, you can you, you can still update of you, you mean update a specific uh, value in a document? Is that? Yeah, no, but, but only in uh, one document, but not in, uh, in the several documents in uh, one time. Ah, bulk update. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry for my presentation. Yes, yes. Um, bulk update is definitely on the roadmap for Elasticsearch. Both the ability to uh, send uh, an update script and then say apply that to those specific uh, documents and the ability to, uh, to send the query and run the update command on all the documents that match that query. It's just a matter of you know, implementing it. Uh, what are the pain points when you do a uh, issue a command to migrate a bunch of indexes around? Like you say, it's fast, but clearly it must break at some point. What typically are those points? Uh, the typical ones, and you see it a lot in Amazon, is uh, network. Because so, effectively, network is your bottleneck when you're moving shards around. You're moving bytes around. Uh, so network is the main resource uh, that is being used when that happens. And in Elasticsearch, actually by default, it throttles the number of concurrent relocations that can happen in a cluster automatically for you. Uh, both the total number of relocations that happen on the cluster level, both in terms of the node level, so you know, two nodes won't create like five relocations between themselves, and then you're, you're possibly having a lot of relocations between them. And there's also an ability to throttle the relocation uh, streaming. So you can say, I just want to allow for, I don't know, 10 megabits per second uh, to be allocated to uh, relocation. So obviously relocation will then take a bit longer, but you don't, usually don't care about it that much. It will happen eventually. Uh, yeah. What will be the main topics on your roadmap till, let's say, your next speech here in Berlin? Uh, good question. So, first of all, uh, uh, what I found with developing Elasticsearch is that the roadmap, roadmap is fluid and it's mainly driven by users. So, uh, a lot of it comes from user demand for features. Here's one of them is bulk updates uh, and, and things like that. Um, Things that I, I really want to focus, uh, want to focus on is the, 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 one of the most important ones is to have smarter shard balancing algorithms. So you won't get situations where um, a single index exists on, a, on where most of the shards for a specific index exist on a specific node or things like that. Or possibly even size based, uh, you know, index size based uh, balancing algorithms. Uh, that's one of those. Uh, uh, it's always uh, another one is um, improving the memory usage when you use things like facets and sorting. Um, that's that's another big one. That's that's the two main ones that I'm looking for zero twenty, uh, at least. Sorry, and obviously once Lucene four decides to happen eventually, then migrating to Lucene four. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm sorry we are running out of time. Um, Oh yeah, definitely. Thank you.